I'm going to be painting and weathering this uh, Ballistus Dreadnought and I had originally intended to do this in the colors of the Dark Angels and so I had assembled it, primed it in black it was just about getting ready to start and then I started seeing all of these videos uh, about the first company of the Dark Angels, the Deathwing and um, they have a really cool looking bone colored armor on their um, their figures so I thought I'd switch up and uh, and do uh, that now what I did to kind of make it a little easier on myself uh, because I'm going to be painting a much lighter color is I airbrushed on some Citadel XV88 and uh, it's just a brown color and I didn't really go for 100% coverage and saturation I just basically wanted to knock the black primer back a little bit to make later uh, lighter colors um, go on a little easier. Now to make the painting a little easier I've broken the kit down into sub-assemblies. Um, I left this piece of armor off so that I can get to these areas underneath here. Of course the arms, is that what you'd want to call them? Um, the weapons, uh, they just have a little uh, notch that you just twist it on so those are easy to get on and off the feet actually mount directly to the base this is a push fit kit so uh, the feet mount directly to the base so I just left the legs off of that there is uh, some little uh, stubs on here that normally you would I would have glued this on so it would be permanently affixed but all I did was just cut everything off of that little peg there so that it'll just slide on there and when I'm done I can glue it together it just makes it a little easier I also covered the base in just some sand from outside in our yard put on a few little pieces of bark and um, I'll, uh, I'll be giving that a coat of primer also and painting that um, as I go along now one of the decisions I have to make early on is do I paint um, there's, a, there's quite a bit of silver metallic black areas things like that on here um, besides and then of course there's the bone armor the bone colored armor so uh, deciding which do I want to paint first I decided to go with the darker colors first simply because it will be um, it will be much easier to cover over those with a little bit of the XV88 to kind of bring it back to this tone and then put the bone armor over that and if any of the bone color gets onto the darker areas. Those are going to be easier to cover up than trying to do it the other way around. There's there's not going to be a perfect method, I think. Um, I'll probably find a point that I would wish I would have done it the other way, but you know, you pick your, you take your chances and you pick your choices and you go with what you got. Now I'll start off painting uh, everything that I want to be either silver or black with Death Reaper from Two Thin Coats. Now this is actually a very dark, dark gray. It's not quite pure black. So it'll allow me to do a little bit of shading over it. I like using black as an undercoat for silver. I think silver just works better over a black undercoat. And so it kind of does two things for me. So there's quite a few parts to uh, paint with this. If you're not sure what color the different parts need to be painted and you want to do something like the box art similar to it or just get inspiration from it just look either at the box art or if you're like me and you purchase this separately on eBay then uh, just get online and look at the photos on the Games Workshop website now that I've got all those details painted black I'm going to dry brush them with Surcoat Silver all over some of them I may go back and repaint another color. But it would just be easier to dry brush everything that I've got painted black at this stage. And then go back and neaten it up with another color if I need to later on. Now I'm going to give everything a heavy coat of Oblivion Black Wash. You could use Nolan oil for this or something like that. Main thing is it's just going to really darken the shadows down and provide a lot of contrast with the metallics. Now it never hurts when you're painting 40k to 
paint some things gold. So I'm going to paint the rim of this sarcophagus thing here, and maybe the skulls, a couple other little components uh, with gold. I probably won't paint too many other things gold at this point because um, I want to see how everything looks towards the end before deciding what other bling I want to put on here. But I know I want to do it here because most of this will be covered up. So I'll go ahead and get it now. And I forgot to mention, I'm using Dragon's Gold from Two Thin Coats. Now while the gold is drying, I'll use some Mithril Blade to just brighten up some of these areas here with these wings. I think I'm going to do them in a silver color. Now I'll go over the gold with some flesh wash from two thin coats. I'm going to try something new for me. This is a red glaze from two thin coats wave two paints. I'm just going to use this right out of the bottle. Never used it before. I wanted to see how it looked just going over these metallics, just like it is. I like that. It definitely works like a glaze, not like a wash, uh, not like a contrast paint. It, it shifts the color, but it still allows that metallic to shine through. But right out of the bottle, it's got enough body that it doesn't run like a wash. It stays in place, but it's still thin enough to put on um, with a brush. So first use of that Too Thin Coats Glaze, and I like it. All right, I think that'll work like that, because once I put this over it, you're not going to see a whole lot of it. So uh, I'll paint those lights in uh, towards the end. So now I think it's about time to move on to that bone-colored armor. All right, step one for painting that bone-colored armor will be to touch up the areas that I had painted with XB88, just touch it up with a brush to kind of reset it back to that XB88. That way when I put the later colors over it, it'll all be going down over the same tone and there won't be multiple colors underneath. Now with that base reestablished, I'm going to go ahead and put on some Ushabti bone, which I've thinned way down because I want it to go on smooth. So what I'll do is I'll put it on in multiple thin coats, trying not to hit the light overhead. And on the other parts where I painted the metal, I'll be very careful not to hit that metal. But if I do hit it, this color is light enough that it will be easy to, uh, to paint over. So I reckon it'll take Oh, probably two and a half, three coats to get this all covered up. Now, if you were looking to do a more weathered approach, you could use a stippling motion, a stippling action, maybe even a dry brush to uh, put this on and leave some of that undercoat shining through, taking advantage of if you know about Lincoln Wright and the machining Krieger world, taking advantage of that poke through chipping where you allow the underlying coat to just kind of poke through and uh, establish some chipping, it just gives the paint a very distressed look. So you decide how you want it to look. Now I'm going to steal a page from Juan Hidalgo's book and I'm going to paint contrast medium over all of this. Now this is a contrast or contrast paint, not contrast medium. This is a contrast paint called Skeleton Horde that I've mixed one-to-one -one with contrast medium. And I'm just going to apply this all over. It's going to tint the armor. It's going to add depth to the recesses. It's going to give it a nice nice color. What I'll do is I'll put this even on the flat areas 
but then before it dries I'll just go in and kind of mop it up with a brush I'm holding it generally straight up and down so that it will flow towards the bottom because I don't want too much pooling but I am going to be going back over this with some more paint so I'm not going to fuss too much if there is a little pooling important thing is to get everything covered so that you don't have any of that base color just shining through now that the skeleton hoard has had plenty of time to dry I'm going to go back to my Oshabti bone I've thinned it uh, close to two parts water one part paint I'm going to apply it with a sponge like this and what I'm looking for is this is going to distress the paint uh, the exterior paint layer it's just going to make it look rough and used and that kind of thing now typically what I do with this besides bumping the lamp is I put on just a light layer like this and then let it dry and then see if I want to add another layer but it just gives it a very worn uh, uh, worn out look and you dial it in how you want um, but the, this uh, the the process of putting the contrast paint on in the background it leaves streaks and and blobs and things like that so when you're putting that on don't don't worry too much about getting it perfect um, those streaks and blobs and things like that when you're doing this method uh, actually help uh, contribute to the worn character of, of uh, the final finish so you just kind of look at it let it dry set it aside do the other parts come back see what you think see here's a good example that type of staining is not what you want one you know generally once you put on contrast paint but if you're anticipating doing this method well then you're not too worried about it because you go on you put this over it and that streaking and staining in the background is going to contribute to the final effect so I don't want to say I discovered this meaning in the original sense as being the first to discover something but I for my own use I, I discovered this one time when I was using contrast paints early on when they first came out and I put some on there and got horrible streaking and after deciding not to throw the model away I said well let me try painting over it so I just happened to be using a, a dry brush and just stippling it on and when I started stippling it on I saw the way it looked and I said wait a minute that actually looks pretty doggone good so as Bob Ross talks about sometimes um, Happy accidents can get you things that you just didn't expect. Now here you can see that that uh, the results of that distressing effect. I really like the way that looks. Now if, if you were trying this and this was more um, of an effect than you wanted, then just go back to your sponge, put on more layers of the, the base color, and it'll it'll just it'll continue adding variation but it'll, it'll just moderate it and lighten it all up and, and of course experiment you can do glazes over this you can do uh, stippling over this you can you can do gradients over this of various things so experiment with adding layers of paint and I think you'll really be pleased with the depth uh, that it adds to the finish Here's another example on the main armor, and uh, I'm really happy with that effect. That's just uh, that's just one layer of of the uh, the sponging, so it it starts off kind of some areas that suggest chipping, worn paint, 
exposure to elements, all sorts of things. So it's a great basis for uh, later weathering steps. Now this wouldn't be 40K without some edge highlighting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something that's a little different. You could paint these in a traditional way, or you could dry brush them, or you could do like I'm doing here. Just take a flat brush and just kind of lay the edge along there. And just edge in all around it like that. The paint is thinned, but not too thin. I'd probably call it one part water, two parts paint. So I left a little bit of body to it. Now later on I'll be using this same color for chipping. So if I get a little extra, then that'll just begin the chipping process. And if you do get some where you don't want it, you know, you get a spot like that, just take your thumb, wipe it off. Do that quick enough, simple, easy. Gives you a little streak, a little more definition. And I'm just using, this is a very flat brush. The key to this, I think, to making this work is the end of the brush is straight across. There's no crazy edges. Now this is just a very cheap brush. Probably, this is one of the ones that I got in a lot in a big, big bundle off of Amazon. That I think they're like 15 cents each. But for this kind of task, they are perfect. Now there's quite a few of these decorations with scary, angry skulls. Ooh, and uh, got this one here. Uh, with the eagle wings and this one over here. There's one over here on the gun. Uh, there may be others around the, the model. I'm going to start by basing these in wyvern green. Now I'm going to go in and shade those down with some celia green shade. To me, it looks like Coelia, but I heard somebody who is smarter about these things than me pronounce it Celia Green Shade, so I'll go with that. But I'll shade this down, and then I'll go back and just brighten up some of the flat surfaces with that wyvern green once again. Now while I'm waiting on that shade to dry, I found a few decals in my stash of decals. I'm just going to wet them down on this paper towel. Putting this few on, I'm not going to bother doing a formal decal application. I'll just let them sit here and soak for a minute. Think about what they've done. And, uh, and then I'll slide them off put them on the model, and hit them with some solve set Because I'm only putting them in a very few places, uh, and I'm going to be weathering it, and because they're opaque decals, I'm not too worried about putting down any kind of gloss coat or anything like that. I'll just do this very informally, so let me get that done. Now I'll use some emerald green from two thin coats. To just go in and add some highlights on these areas around the eagle and around the dealy thingy over here. Now I'll use ethereal green. I'm just going to skim along that top edge to highlight it just a little bit. And I'll do that on all the way around the top of the skull. And then I'll also just go out and highlight just the lower edge of the feathers and then going out to the full tip like that. 
And then I'll do similar highlighting on these items and things like that, just to give it a little bit of depth. Now this guy was very active in the local uh, county fair process. And he won a lot of awards, it appears, at the county fair. So this might be for the biggest pumpkin, and this might be for the prize winning pig. And maybe this is for the best apple pie. Who knows? But we're going to paint all of his county fair awards with ivory tusk for the ribbons. And the reason I'm using ivory tusk, normally I'd use a bone type color, but because the rest of the armor is in a bone color, I wanted to switch to something that was a little different to help differentiate it. So that's why I'm using this. Because we don't want anybody to miss seeing his county fair awards. Now I'll paint the awards themselves with sword hilt burgundy. And again, I'm using something, normally I would have picked red for this, but I'm using something a little different to distinguish it from the red markings, just to help give a little differentiation. I'll highlight the awards with glistening gums. Now I'll highlight the little hangy down things with Trooper White, just to give them a little, little depth, little volume. Now I'll do a recess shade, very carefully, with Sarah from Sepia, which is a, a shade from Citadel that I think will work very nicely with this bone colored armor. I'm just using it right out of the pot. I'm not thinning it at all. But by using this, this liner brush, I can, it's a two zero liner brush. I can get it into the recesses and I'll get it around the rivets and uh, other places just to help all of these things stand out again. When I'd done the distressing, it had covered up much of that initial coat of skeleton hoard that I had put on. So this will just reestablish that. And I'll just do this all over the suit. And I'll do it all around all of the various decorations and his county fair awards and just all the different angles and bits and bobs and all of that to help help them stand out a bit. Now I'm going to do some chipping, and I'm going to do brush chipping because I want to try and keep it a little more restrained than I normally do. And I say try because I don't often succeed at that because I like chipping. But just a more restrained look, hopefully. And of course, chipping is going to go in logical areas. You know, you're not likely to have chips, say, back up in here, because those are going to be protected areas. It's going to be in areas that are going to scrape against things. Certainly, fragments flying around on the battlefield may cause chips. But I don't want this thing to appear like it's just completely battle-weary. You know, any military vehicle, and this, despite its odd lore, any military vehicle is going to go through periods of combat and then a maintenance cycle and then back into combat. And those maintenance cycles can include paint touch-ups, replacement of parts, things like that. So I'm going to be more restrained about it. Now I'm using a mix of Scorched Earth and Death Reaper. I wanted a very very dark 
desaturated brown color. And my idea for the brown here is not so much that it, whoops, didn't want that there like that. It's not so much that I'm not trying to represent oxidization, rust, and things like that. I just wanted a warm brown to go with the warm colors of the rest of the model. Another thing I like to do is, however heavy I put the chipping at the top, as it goes progressively down, I'll make it a little heavier, because obviously down around the feet there's going to be more chipping, more wear and tear. Um, so, but it's all things to think about. Certainly, when you're doing your chipping, you do it exactly how your model should be chipped. Because you get to decide that. One thing I do like to consider when I'm chipping is that to a certain degree, chipping can be edge highlighting. So keep that in mind in your own work. That sometimes chipping serves a dual purpose. It's going to give it a, a battle-worn appearance, but it can also help bring out edges and things like that that might otherwise be a little obscured in some places. Just a chip here there, especially in long corners like this, areas like that, where three or more angles, three or more lines come together, it really helps those get popped out a little bit from everything around them. I'm going to use some Agrax Earthshade in various places to represent kind of oil stains and things like that. I want them to be distinct from the uh, just the shadows. So I'm going to use Agrax Earthshade. It's a little more brown, so it will have a a little more of a standout look. You can do these wherever you think it needs it. It doesn't have to be everywhere. I'm not going to coat it. I'm not going to coat all the parts with it because then it wouldn't stand out very much. But I just want it to represent oil, fluid, you know, because I, w I would imagine that something this size that's mechanical that can walk, there's a huge amount of... Uh, thermodynamic fluid, is that the word, um, events happening in uh, maybe the 41st century, but physics still apply, and things will leak, especially combat vehicles, because they're used so um, rough. I mean, they have to be. You know, I, I remember we took care of, when I was in the Army, we took care of our vehicles. Changed the oil when we were supposed to and, you know, did all the maintenance on them. But when we had to floor the engine to get to an area or to get out of an area, when it mattered, um, we didn't treat it like it was our car back home and we were trying to save gas, so... I applied that thinking to this. Now it can also be used to make stains on the armored parts. All I'm going to do is just place in some quick little streaks here and there like that it's fairly thin light application I want it to be fairly subtle now you could use oils and enamels here I'm just choosing not to for the sake of speed oils and enamels would certainly be more um, more controllable in terms of 
your ability to blend them and do things like that. But this works too. And it has its own look to it. Sometimes if I'm getting really advanced in my weathering, I like to combine acrylic staining and oils and well usually not enamels I've kind of given up on enamels because I think oils are, are better overall and I can do anything I need to with the oils that I can do with enamels but just some light stippling and things like that and you can just stipple around sometimes just to suggest stains and things like that using different colors is going to add to the depth of the of the effect and then like if you know if you want to get a little more dramatic you can put a big blob somewhere like that you can even dip your brush over in the water clean it up a little bit come in with the water and just thin it out blend it around do whatever you want and if you don't like it, wipe it off. <laughs> Not that I didn't like that, but I just wanted to demonstrate. It's very flexible. It's very fast drying. So it's not that acrylics aren't flexible. It's they're just not flexible when it comes to time. But you work fast, and you're familiar with the product, you can get whatever you want out of them. I think that's the key to mastering the products that we use is to just not be afraid to put them on. Put them on, see what happens. You're not going to ruin your model. You can paint over it, you can weather over it. If you have to, you can sand it away. I mean, that's how, that's how I've learned things. It's just by being willing to take risks. I get questions quite often from very kind of people who say nice things, and then they ask me, how did you learn to do this, or how did you learn to do that? And the simplest answer is, I did it. And I read about it, I watched somebody apply it, you know, I watched... As, I, as I'm proof, any idiot can have a YouTube channel. But you never know what you're going to learn from somebody. So I watch as many things as I can, read what I can. And then when I get a product, I just start testing it. And by testing, I mean I put it on a model. I figure it out. I get what I want out of it. If it doesn't do what I want, I either change the way I'm applying it I find another product. But when I hear people say, oh, you can't weather with acrylics, I would say you can. <laughs> it's nothing special. It's just taking the time to figure it out. Now I use some known oil using the same kind of application method, just a light stippling and streaking and stuff like that. I think sometimes when it comes to the staining process, this, this weathering, multiple colors really adds to the depth of finish. I mean, there's multiple colors of fluids in, say, your car. You know, you've got radiator fluid, which is what is it, green? Fuel has kind of a, you know, reddish, kind of orangish look to it. Oil, of course, is very, very black looking. Although, if you really look at it, it's got, it seems like it almost has a tint of blue to it. And sometimes putting these colors over previous stains can really, really be nice. I think it can, again, add to that depth of finish, not completely coloring it, covering it up. But say, right here, mind focus, yeah, mostly. 
See right here, I can go in, just touch in some additional color. Why is that there? Who knows? You get to decide. I think that's an interesting thing to do in modeling is add in some features that you don't necessarily have a backstory for them. But in, you, I mean, you may have one in your own mind, but you don't have to talk about it and tell anybody. You can just say that's a point that somebody says, so what's that stain there for? You go, well, what do you think it's there for? You let the viewer write their own story about your model. Sometimes that can be the most compelling and interesting pieces is the one that provoke the ones that provoke thought examination if somebody's looking at my model and they spend time looking at it I always appreciate that somebody just glances at it and goes oh yeah that's cool I didn't really look at it but when somebody takes some time to look in and go ooh I see that I like that that's when you know they've looked at it and they're appreciating the work that you've put into it. Another beautiful thing that you can do with weathering, that's what I'm doing here, is in a few places I got some of the bone colored paint onto the metallics. I just put some of this fluid staining over the top, shifts everything. Goes from looking like it was a bad paint job to a bad paint job that's been concealed under fluid stains. <laughs> now there are various lenses and lights around the model and I'm going to start off by basing those in some trooper white. It's not a pure white but for these purposes Anything close to pure white will work just fine. Now for the various lights around it, I'm going to use some fluorescent colors. Now this is Vallejo model color fluorescent yellow that I'm going to use on this headlight here. I like using fluorescence because it's kind of an easy one-step method to just get a really good pop of color. Sometimes I like to do the multicolor, more traditional way where you put in a darker color and a lighter color and all of that stuff and the little white dot in the corner. But I'm also lazy, so these fluorescent colors allow me to get this in here and it's got a really bright color. It looks kind of cool. At least I think it does. Normally on these gun areas, it's traditional to use red, but I want this to pop. So I'm going to use this magenta. It's another fluorescent color from Vallejo. And I'll use this on the other gun and maybe one or two places on the main, the main body. I'll just put this on. What I'm doing is I'm putting it on letting it dry and then putting on another coat just to really get a good strong strong uh, look to it but yeah that's going to really really pop I like that now on this main viewing lens instead of using blue again which is more traditional I'm going to go with a fluorescent green and my choice of color here is simply because the fluorescent blue I have which is from AK Interactive. Just isn't really got a lot of pop, doesn't really have a lot of pop to it. But this green, it practically glows. <laughs> so I'll put some of that in there. I'll hit that little one there. And then I'll flip it over. Get this one here. Like that. 
Yeah, I'll let that dry, see if they need a second coat. And I'll call the lights done. Now I've not applied any kind of matte varnish or anything to the model. Um, so that the finish on most of the surfaces is like I wanted. I don't know that I need to do any kind of final clear coat. But the decal areas, I don't know if it'll show up. But they've got just a little bit of a gloss shine to it. It may show up there. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get some Lamian Medium, which is from Citadel. And I'm just going to paint it over the decals themselves. I'm not going to go really out onto the surface of the model because it has the finish, like I said, that I want. But this will just dull down that shine around the model, around the decal, and hopefully bring it in line a little more like the rest of the the model's finish. Now if you were going to just airbrush on a matte coat over this, or a satin varnish or whatever you chose, there would be no need for this step. Keep in mind your model doesn't always have to be completely matte varnished. Real objects have areas that are shiny and areas that are um, very matte, some that are satiny, there can be streaks of it, there can be mixes of it. Um, so there's there's quite a bit of variety in terms of finish that can go on with your model. So I try to avoid having to feel like I need to put on a matte coat over everything. Now if you're going to be playing with a piece it's going to be a gaming piece. You're going to be handling it a lot, such as a gunpla or something like that. Well, then some kind of clear, final clear coat may be a good idea just to protect the finish. So you decide it's your model. Go with what works for you. Well, I think I'm going to call the Ballista Stread Knot done. Um, off camera, I did the, the base. Uh, the, the kit comes with, the, the foot is molded into this rock part, uh, and then this foot is separate. And I, I would have rather it not been molded in. Um, I guess I could have covered it up with some other stuff, but I just glued it on there and uh, put down some dirt from my own backyard and just did some dry brushing with some earth colors over the dirt and then some grays over the rock. And then just use some contrast paints and things like that to just paint it in. Nothing, nothing drastic. Um, these are just a couple of pieces of uh, bark from a pine tree uh, just to make a couple of additional rocks. So, um, uh, and then I painted this green. Uh, I think it's called Angel's Green or something like that. It's from the new Vallejo uh, model color or uh, game color line. But it, it's pretty much a match for the Dark Angel, so I thought it'd be appropriate to, to uh, put on the rim of the base like that. But overall, I'm, I'm happy with this. I had fun with it. Uh, I really like the way the, the surface of uh, the model turned out. You can see the, uh, the distressing effects of the paint there, hopefully. Um, I'm quite happy with how, how that that surface looks. I mean, that, that looks like something that's been used, that's been worn, that's been uh, out in combat. It's it's not my usual heavy weathering job. I'd call it a subtle weathering job, subtle chipping. I was able to keep it subtle, so I'm fairly happy with that. Uh, I kept the the rest of the the model fairly simple, if you noticed. I didn't, I've seen some of these that were done in this color scheme that had various red elements on them. Um, and things like that, various decorations. I deliberately kept this simple. Um, I just kind of wanted to, uh, I really liked the look as, as, uh, I'd seen, I think I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I'd seen quite a few people do, uh, this Deathwing scheme with this bone colored armor. And I was just really interested in, 
um, getting that look. And uh, the rest of it is just kind of kind of simple. I had fun with the, the fluorescence, the pops of color there. Um, they're, uh, they're different, but I like them. They make me smile, which is, uh, which is good enough. I don't know if you noticed, but I painted in some words on these little banners um, on, on the way home uh, before I painted that part. I had listened to uh, uh, Megadeth on, uh, on my, in my car, and the uh, last song I listened to before I came in the house was Polaris. Um, if, you've, if you know Megadeth, you probably know that song. And uh, so I painted that on the, the chest banner, and then on his knee, there I painted Nukem. <laughs> so I figured that was that was appropriately uh, 40k sounding. So I thought I'd go with it. Hopefully, Games Workshop will release this as a standalone kit. Um, it's definitely uh, worth building. It's a lot of fun, and uh, I like the I like the look of it, the simplicity of it, and uh, I'd recommend it to uh, to anybody. Uh, to build, and uh, you can pick so many colors, so many different factions. So uh, that's that's always a, a a bonus having just you know, wide open in terms of color choice, and then you can always do your own. So that's that's a a great thing. It's it's really just a blank palette, uh, uh, rather a blank canvas to uh, to just do what you want. So go to town on it if you get one. Well, thank you so much for watching this video and uh, especially if you're still watching at this point. Um, I know I know uh, it's a time investment and I'm grateful that you would that you would uh, uh, still be hanging around and watching. And certainly if you are a patron, thank you uh, for supporting me over on patreon. There's a link down below to that if you'd like to uh, like to see that. Um, it's a blessing to me and my family, and we are thankful for you and for your support. And with all that being said, I'll leave you with one final thought, as I always like to do. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.